Hello, and uh, thank you very much for attending the seminar today. I think it's going to be really fascinating. Um, we're here to discuss the myriad issues that are preoccupying our manufacturing companies and that will determine their success or failure in 2021 and beyond. This was always going to be an uncertain year with the UK's exit from the single market and the prospect of a new administration in the United States. But already we can see that the volatility and risks are even more substantial than we might have expected and certainly than we might have hoped. So it's really great to have our panel here today giving us insight into issues such as the future of our trading relationship with the EU uh, to the prospects back here at home domestically for our manufacturers. And again, just to remind you, I'd be really keen to get some feedback from you throughout the course of this webinar. Um, it, that way you'll get your questions answered more quickly and it also helps to stimulate the discussion. So please don't hesitate to use that Q&A function. So I'd like to introduce our panel today and we're very lucky to have with us a range of, of experts in no particular order. Um, I'll kick off with James Brown, Senior Economist at Make UK and co-author of the report who will talk us through some of the key findings. Bridget Phillipson, Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury and Labour MP for Sunderland. We have Kara Haffey uh, from the Advisor Population uh, from PwC, UK Automotive and Manufacturing Leader at PwC. We're very lucky to have Lord Hammond, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, but who has also acted as Secretary of State for Defence and Foreign Secretary and been a former businessman. Um, so he knows he knows what many of you might be feeling. We have Robin McGeechee, founder and chairman of Peak Scientific, a, a leading expert in high, high performance nitrogen and hydrogen gas generator systems, talking about from the SME, rapidly growing up SME perspective. And finally, last but not least, Stephen Phipson, Chief Executive of Make UK, the voice of manufacturing in the UK. So first, I'd like to turn to James to talk us through the key findings of the report. James, can you summarize um, what the study has found, please? Sure, thanks, Peggy. I'm going to put up a few slides to help explain that. There we are. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to walk you through a very brief five minute summary of some of the key findings of the report before the discussion um, from our excellent panel. And this executive survey looks forward into 2021, detailing the steps needed to maintain and further a strong industrial base in the UK. What steps manufacturers plan to take to remain agile and responsive in the current climate. And finally, the key risks that manufacturers themselves have identified as the biggest challenges to prosperity in 2021. The report is based on a survey of 206 manufacturers and publishes at an opportune time as the industry continues to navigate the evolving business environment at the start of the year. Now I'll show you a chart representing manufacturers' views about overall eco economic conditions in 2021 while describing some of the key findings from the three core sections of the report. So under the header of building a strong industrial base in the UK, so despite continued uncertainty, manufacturers remain fairly optimistic for the year ahead, with almost half expecting improvements in their industry. More companies are saying that the opportunities to succeed outweigh the risks for 2021, um, and the UK is still seen as a competitive place to do manufacturing. And after a, la a year of large-scale redundancies and heavy use of the government's furlough scheme, 2021 should see recruitment pick back up and employee numbers increase. But now under navigating our new relationship with the EU, the impact of the UK leaving the EU will be felt next year, with manufacturers most concerned about the investment prospects for UK businesses and the UK's attractiveness to international talent. But external risks are outweighing manufacturers' internal risks for 2021, including our new relationship with the EU, but so are national and local lockdowns weighing heavily on companies' minds. And looking to the future in terms of developing an agile and responsive manufacturing sector, over half of manufacturers will be investing in new product development in 2021. Investment in digital and green technologies will also be prioritized with the latter aimed at reducing costs. And building on the success of remote working in 2020, manufacturers will be building agility into their businesses by providing a flexible working environment. So new products, new markets and building resilience will play a key role in ensuring manufacturers remain agile in 2021. And I'll take us through some brief data points before I hand back to the panel. But here we can see what changes manufacturers are expecting in their business in 2021 in key business areas. 
Now, the two largest expected improvements from this set here are in productivity and in permanent employees. And the largest decrease from this set are expected in profit margins. Here on the left, we see expected changes in trade for 2021, and trade will be a significant topic of focus in 2021 as manufacturers navigate this new trading relationship with both the European Union and the global market. And here we can see that manufacturers expect the largest uptick in exports to be from the US on the far left there, and then followed by Asia Pacific and South America. Separately, the report also finds that two fifths of companies are looking to invest in green with the predominant reason given being for cost-saving measures. And separately, on an operational staffing basis, 43% of manufacturers have reported that they will explore how to keep remote working in place even after the pandemic has passed. And finally, here we have the top five biggest risks to business plans in 2021 that were identified by manufacturers themselves out of a choice of 17 risks for 2021. And we can see here that delays at customs tops the list, with national and local lockdowns coming in a close second. EU regulation, input costs, and political instability complete the top five risks. Now, in this brief overview, I've only really scratched the surface of the insight contained in the report. So please do go and find the report, which is now available on our website, which expands on all that I've touched on so far and much more. So thank you very much. And now I'll hand back to Peggy and the panel. Thank you very much, James. And you're absolutely right. Um, you know, there's an awful, there's a wealth of, of detail and data in that report. Um, and I think there were some findings that quite surprised me that we can dig into a little bit later. But first, I'd like to get the reaction um, uh, from the industry perspective on, on what companies are telling us in this report. Stephen, it would be interesting to get your view about what you think uh, are the really important facts to draw out and what are, what are companies actually telling us? Um, I think there's a couple of things. Thank, thank you, Peggy. I think there's a couple of things that really strike me here. First of all, I mean, it's in two halves if you think about it. We've got the sort of short-term challenges and, and, and the continuing challenges that people have seen through the pandemic. And then we've got, we'll come on to secondly, some of the opportunities that people and what, what the conditions are like to enable that to happen, what needs to happen in the UK for those to be realised. But if we think about the challenges, Obviously, the relationship with the EU focuses very highly in this report. Um, we spent a lot of time over the last few months preparing as far as we could with that, with hundreds, um, in some cases, thousands of manufacturers, depending on the subject. And then, of course, most of the conditions of the deal weren't really known until right at the end. But what's become apparent is just the sheer complexity and the bureaucracy that's required. And it goes further than that that's reported largely in the media. It's not just about the customs delays. It's about rules of origin calculations, which thousands of manufacturers have never had to do before. It's about conformity assessment and really the equivalence in terms of regulations going forwards and the fact we don't have mutual recognition for qualifications. So lots of other things are bearing down on people as they try to navigate their way through. And it's also quite apparent that as we've been working very closely with the Cabinet Office and Michael Gove's team, that government wasn't that prepared either. I mean, a lot of preparations were made, but still some gaps in terms of how to implement things like the Northern Ireland Protocol. So there's a lot of that going on. What manufacturers did do was stockpile as much as they could up before that happened. And so we're in a situation now where the traffic at the borders is fairly light. It's about half of what it needs to be normally if we look at the Northern Ireland GB order, um, border and about a third if we look at the Dover Calais crossing. So we're still in a situation where, although I've seen in the press it reported that, uh, well, it's not as not there's not the big tailbacks we expected and those sorts of things, that will start to happen at the end of this month, which is why we've seen Michael Gove come out and say there's some bumpy times ahead of us. So, so that comes out in sharp focus here around those challenges. We're calling it the customs delays, but it's a much wider topic than that. And actually, manufacturers are quite resilient, quite pragmatic, and are, are asking lots of questions about the way to facilitate that and make it more streamlined. But we are going to go through months here of disruption and some longer term real challenges when it comes down to equivalence of regulation, any potential divergence, what we're doing about marking, what we're doing about service technicians traveling across borders, all of those kinds of real practical things that uh, companies need to plan their business for this year. So, so that comes out 
Um, and, and, and I think it comes out strongly when we say, we say about nearly a third of companies are, talk, are considering their exports to the UK may well reduce this year because of this additional bureaucracy. Remember, that happens not just here in the UK, but is also happening on the continent as well when they're trying to export into the UK or they're part of that just-in-time delivery process. So, so lots of concerns there. I think another point that comes out strongly is the access to talent. Um, one of the challenges for the manufacturing sector that's been there for years, particularly on vocational qualifications, has been access to talent. We've been filling lots of those gaps with EU nationals for many years, and we're not quite ambitious enough in this country yet with our training programmes, and we need to see that really push forwards if we're going to be able to, to sustain the sort of talent that we need to make manufacturing successful. So, so there, those challenges come out, I think, in stark, stark reality in this report. But also on the positive side, we are talking about some of those really new areas where there's a lot of excitement to get involved. We've learned through the pandemic about digital collaboration. We've learned about the use of digital technologies to produce products quicker. There's a lot of interest in the new green net zero type technologies, the manufacturing of, of a lot of those um, technologies in this country where we've got some leadership positions. And so I think the other point that comes out there is that we need to create the right conditions for that um, to make sure that investment is made in the UK. And that comes down uh, very clearly to me to having a really robust and uh, a reset on the industrial strategy going forwards, something that's long term. I always say this to ministers, but manufacturing is a long term sport. Very often manufacturing investment time horizons are 10 years. If you look at a car line, in a car manufacturer, it's around a seven year cycle. So they need to see these, these plans, industrial strategies, those in investment conditions being long-term and surviving part of the parliamentary cycle. So we'll be looking very hard to that in the first part of this year and seeing if we can get some ambition built into our industrial plan going forwards to realize some of the opportunities that are coming out strongly in this report. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Stephen. And that's a, that's a tour de force across a, a lot of the, the, the concerns and needs of, of manufacturers in the UK. Cara, you, you, you advise many industrial companies, lots of automotive companies who obviously feel quite um, uh, vulnerable at the moment. Are you seeing a lot more nervousness about this year when you look at this report as a co-sponsor of the report? When you look at it, were there things that surprised you that came out of it? Yeah, thank you, Peggy. Um, we're delighted to co-sponsor and help make UK and our manufacturing industry in the UK with this report. Um, I think you're right. I think, um, I suppose, what didn't surprise me, unfortunately, was the reflection on the change in the relationship with the EU, the customs and other things that, that Stephen has so eloquently talked about. I think um, what this did surprise me positively and was heartening was the look ahead, so the business resilience. We know our manufacturers tend to be agile and they've got a lot of energy and drive to um, adapt to the things in front of them. So I was heartened by some of the positives coming out of it about the investment in people and the other investments, particularly in digital, because we've talked about that a lot with our clients. Um, over the last couple of years and I really feel that people have had a step change last year possibly forced upon them but um, at the same point people will actually be taking this as a real drive um, and there's some interesting angles about where digital investment is going that we can potentially get to later on but I don't want to keep people away from the great panel um, so I'll stop there but it's great to, to get this report launched and what a timely timely report it is just as we um, look at the headlines and also think about how we continue to develop our industry. Thank you Cara, you're, you're quite right, the timeliness is, is quite striking. I think uh, I'll, we'll turn then to our first topic and try and put this in a global context for manufacturers in 2021 and my goodness, you know, I was the thing that surprised me was that companies put political instability in one of their in their top five risks for 2021. And and I just thought to myself, that's really something if you'd asked me five years ago, I wouldn't necessarily have have thought of. But the events last week in the United States uh, yeah, tell us that even it comes out of the most surprising places, trade tensions with China are not going to disappear. Uh, Lord Hammond, with your vast experience um, you know, in government, I'd be really curious to know how you're looking at the context for manufacturers in 2021, 
trade tensions with China, political volatility, US. Um, you know, when we look at this, how do you see the landscape for 2021 for manufacturers? How can they plan in this? And and do you think maybe companies are exaggerating the p- potential volatility? And I suppose I would add to that, you know, the West's approach to China, which is obviously a market in COVID is recovering more quickly, potentially an opportunity for us. I mean, do you have a view on what the West's policy towards China, trade policy should be towards China? Well, um, that's a lot of ground to cover. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) First of all, look, the the, the positive is um, we're going to be hopefully seeing some U.S. leadership uh, over the coming years with a new administration in the U.S., And although I don't expect President Biden's fundamental policy on China will be very different from President Trump's, the tone uh, and the manner of delivering it will be very different. And tone uh, does matter. China is a a huge challenge for the West. Um, uh, We we have experience of dealing with a strategic rival that has a puny economy in the Soviet Union. We have no experience of how to manage a strategic rival that is also uh, increasingly an economic challenger. And there's a lot of thinking got to go into this. People who just say, look, we have to contain China, we have to um, try and stop China's strategic growth, are not thinking straight. China is already the world's second largest economy. Um, It's too late to have that discussion. We have to work out how we can engage with China in a way that protects uh, our interests. As I said, I think US leadership is going to be crucial. We're going to be going through a period of time when the COVID um, pandemic accelerates the shift of economic wealth and prosperity from the old world to Asia. Um, We're going to see a big change in the politics of climate because we will now see the US fully engaged with the Europeans uh, and the Japanese and others on trying to push the climate change agenda forward. And I think that's a very positive thing, not just because it's good in its in itself, but because it is a basis for a renewed collaboration between the old uh, North Atlantic um, allies. Um, but I think, look, um, uh, over, our, over all of this, we also have to remember that our central banks across the world have pumped trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars into the economy. Uh, building up public debt. That has uh, an effect on asset values, uh, on the way monetary policy will be conducted in the future. And I think um, there's a there's a huge challenge here for us as well. So I think the key thing is Europe and the old world has got to raise its productivity dramatically uh, over the coming years if we're going to protect living standards in our own countries. Uh, we've got to leverage our embedded advantages And above all, we've got to stop taking it for granted that we are rich. We are in relative decline and we need to fight for every pound of trade, every pound of GDP growth. Thank you for that. I I don't know whether to feel emboldened or or very concerned by by the picture that's being painted. It's clear there's a huge challenge. Uh, Robin, you are... um, exporting to China, I think. I mean, what is your experience? Are you seeing increased demand? And are you seeing at the same time, one of the big concerns for a lot of companies is especially in this whole trade atmosphere, trade tensions, you know, the questions about IP and how you protect that when you're operating in China. Is it the case that we have to give that up in order to take advantage of that opportunity? It's a very good question. And uh, taking what Lord Hammond was saying, uh, the challenge is China. This, uh, if you look at last month for us, we doubled our sales to China. Um, In terms of relative terms, that's a significant number. I've got 100 people in Shanghai. Um, Having said that, which is great to see that increase, the concern I have is the increasing rhetoric um, about Hong Kong. Understandably, we need to uh, stamp down on the abuse of of, uh, power that China has from Beijing over, over Hong Kong, for instance. But if we push it too far, and we get a situation like we had in Australia, where the Chinese government took umbrage to uh, Australians talking out against them. And the impact that had on wine exports to China was a significant impact. And so there's a challenge from the point of view, from a manufacturing perspective, our perspective of making products the Chinese want, and the Chinese government potentially turning around at the drop of a hat and saying, um, there's a tariff here that's going to be very significant. So. 
a huge opportunity, but a little bit of concern to the point that we will actually open a manufacturing plant in China later this year to potentially counter that move. Thank you, Robin. Um, I think I was also interested in, Lord Hammond, you saying that obviously the politics of climate change are going to accelerate this year. Um, I'd be interested to know uh, from uh, your perspective, Cara, whether you're hearing, uh, because even in the survey, I was struck that although we're saying, say, two-fifths of companies say they're investing in green technology in order to cut costs, that still leaves 60%. Now, I know that it's not necessarily that 60% are not investing in green technology, but in some of this data, I was quite struck by the fact that, you know, we're still talking minority. It isn't that 195% of companies are saying we're investing in green technology. So, Cara, I'd be interested to know um, from you really uh, and the companies you talk to, how much more seriously are they really taking it? Or are there still an awful lot of people who in a cash constrained environment post pandemic, uncertainty are wary of the cost that's going to demand from them, the investment that's going to demand? And, and are we in the UK behind other countries or ahead? I think, um, yeah, no, I think it is an interesting point. I think it's definitely being talked about much more now, Peggy. So I'd say in the last couple of years, and particularly in the last six months, you know, this piece of um, green digital revolution, net zero, you know, so very much a part of boardroom discussions. But I think you're right. I think we also have to be realistic that for some businesses, they are in survival mode at the moment. You know, it's been very, very difficult year. Um, my children were saying to me only last week that they don't want to talk about 2020 anymore. So there will be other boardrooms who probably feel exactly the same way. And therefore, I think we have to be realistic that there's investment needed for some of this before we would get the benefit. Um, but I do think it is something that's definitely much more front of mind. Um, and if we can get the balance between green investment also helping costs, then that will also be something that can be picked up on easier. Um, however, I do think that the UK needs to lead in this. There's a great place for us to lead on some of um, the manufacturing around this and use it as something that we can invest in and be um, ahead of other countries on. So the, the challenge is there. Some people are doing it very well. Um, I'd say one of the things to say to people is that kind of really thinking about your electricity bill, which machines, you know, we don't always think in this round nature of our investment and how is it going to kind of go to all the costs of the year um, and looking at it that way. But I'll leave it there, Peggy. But yes, plenty of different, as you say, different responses. And I can understand why in the year that we've come through. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, slightly switch tack a little bit and go, come on to the question of, of Britain leaving the single market. Um, and it seems to me that, you know, okay, we've we struck, we got a deal at the very last minute. It's a relatively thin deal. So I suppose I'd be interested in knowing um, really how much further does this trading relationship have to evolve? Can we really strike enough deals to make a difference? I mean, Bridget, I'd be interested to hear um, your perspective on that uh, from the point of view of the opposition, just where you think we need to push this further um, and, and what you feel is particularly important. Thanks very much, uh, Peggy. And just to say uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, join the panel today and for the excellent report, which I think sets out uh, many of the challenges that manufacturing uh, businesses are facing right now. I think Going to the survey, it does show that I think despite a lot of the, the rhetoric that we've seen from government, there has been sadly too little engagement with the actual difficulties that business are facing at the moment. Um, and that many of those challenges um, are being either ignored or, or being actively exacerbated. I think just to, to take one example, you know, we've been calling for the government to make sure that we have enough uh, extra customs agents, uh, which ministers accept are needed. Uh, and yet companies are still seeing this um, as the biggest risk. Um, you know, a third of companies believe uh, that investment uh, prospects for UK businesses will decrease um, having left the EU. I mean, I think some of these were always going to be foreseeable issues, really. Um, and that the government's approach, I don't think, has been in the right place in responding to some of it. Uh, our view as an opposition is that we need a partnership with business that's founded on responsibility, a covenant between business and government. Um, governments shouldn't, of course, be handing uh, money out hand over fist to business, but it is the role of government to identify uh, those key sectors of our economy uh, that will need support into the future. And that means 
resolving the customs issues on the supply side. It also means looking at some of the challenges that we're going to continue to face around the pandemic, whether it's furlough and the need, I think, for a better training offer. Um, but also going to some of the wider points that Stephen picked up earlier around um, investment in our people, uh, as well as investment in infrastructure to uh, the challenge that Lord Hammond addressed around climate change, which is a very real one, uh, but also does present huge opportunities, I think, to the UK economy and also will um, address some of the imbalances that we see in terms of regional performance. You know, parts of our country that have a really proud and strong manufacturing tradition would be well placed uh, to respond to that and to be driving that innovation of the future. But, you know, you only have to, I think, look at some of the immediate outcomes that we're already beginning to see to know that we'll need further action from the government. Uh, in my part of England, we saw uh, just recently a major industrial plant on Teesside announce closure um, because uh, as a major customer moves uh, to source a product from France. So that these are these are bolts out of the blue, both in lo for local economies and for the wider impact that that will have. But I think we need to see the government getting ahead of some of this to prevent further job losses at a time where, you know, we're, we're starting to look to consider what that recovery might look like, but we're still in a very precarious situation and, and our economy is facing uh, the worst um, recession of any major economy. So big challenges ahead, but I think, you know, clearly we need to be optimistic about the future, the challenges that, uh, this, you know, that can be addressed and the opportunities around job creation that the government can support, I think, in the years ahead, not least uh, in greening the economy and around decarbonisation. Thank you, Bridget. I suppose it raises the question. I've read various reports, so forgive me if I get the numbers wrong, but things like leaving a single market takes away four points of growth and striking trade deals with, I don't know, Japan or whoever is not 0.4 points of growth. Uh, James, I'd be curious to know from your perspective as an economist, you know, is it really possible to strike enough deals to to make up the difference? What would it take to make up the difference? Is it is it not really that we're going to lose that, that's just potentially what it represents. Um, what is your view about the challenge on that particular front? Sure, well, I, I'd say what needs to be brought up is the immediate challenge businesses have faced despite um, the trade deal. So the, the sort of day-to-day -day operational challenge in the run-up um, for businesses not aware what they need to do in terms of tariff markings, tariff codes that came really at the 11th hour and they weren't quite sure how to, how to program their systems right down to machines that would take tariff codes and so on. So really sort of seems trivial issues, but have made businesses essentially, we've heard a lot of businesses pause um, trading for January. They took this decision in December that come deal or no deal. Um, it's so last minute that they wanna see how the dust settles and perhaps resume action in February. So we're really expecting on, on that information that we've received that when we come and look at that January data come February, we're going to expect a very a very strange month indeed for those that did plow on um, with the deal and took advantage where they could, and those looking to learn best practice throughout the month of January um, while while staying fairly quiet on the export front to learn how they're going to move forwards in terms of what regulations they need to take advice on, on what they need to do going forwards. Um, in terms of answering the second part of your question is, is there ever amounts enough enough deals to, to get back to where we were? Um, of course, is, is a theory, of course, of course, there is. Um, however, these things are going to take time and from where, where the position where we are at now with the, with the current incumbent deal, um, a lot more work will need to be done and there will be loss of, of trade as companies seek new partners in that interim period. So there's either way we look at this, there's definitely growth in space that we need to catch up. Um, and of course, the issues in the current climate only compound that difficulty. Uh, particularly in terms of access to capital, access to cash flow, and, and a suppressed investment. Um, you have issues with the UK's attractiveness of a cus as a customer um, being attacked on, on multiple, as, sorry, as a producer being attacked on multiple fronts, um, not just by virtue of being more difficult to trade with. Thank you, James. I mean, we were hearing on the news this morning about how lorries between Northern Ireland and the UK, they were able to bring their goods in, but the paperwork for those trying to export into Northern Ireland um, was stopping the trucks from being able to replenish themselves and carry goods back to Northern Ireland. It didn't bode well, really. It, it felt very uncertain. Um, Robin, I'd be curious from your perspective, you know, as a, a 
smallish, ambitious company wanting to export, what your feeling is about what the opportunities are outside the EU? Is there enough support? And, and you know, what can the government do to support your ambitions? Do you think that you can, that we can make up the loss of the EU or if there is a loss by non-EU countries exporting to those countries? Uh, we export to 100 plus countries, and I would say the most difficult ones for us to export to are the Europeans, uh, France, Germany, Italy, Spain. Uh, and the reason for that is sort of twofold. One is language. We're not very good at our languages in the UK, uh, and we have to transact our business action actually in the language of the country. And I also believe you're, you're also competing against com countries where they are already manufacturing a similar product. So you have a disadvantage for trying to import a product into a given country. If you go further afield, Taiwan, Korea, China, uh, South America, down to Peru, Lima, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, Argentina, et cetera, you are competing uh, like for like typically if you've manufactured a product. With a manufactured product from Germany, Italy, or Spain, or America, you're on a level playing field. And the opportunities, I think, are significant. Um, for all those companies that have been exporting to, to Europe, if they've been successful there, I think there's nothing to stop them actually being very, very successful elsewhere around the world. In terms of practicalities of business support, um, I don't think we need to look any, any very far away to see what Germany has done with their manufacturing. They saw manufacturing as a very significant part of their economy. Um, if you go to China, um, there's a German center in Pudong. It's huge. It's got 60 rooms for people to stay at, it's got conference facilities. It's, it cries out to anyone passing, and I pass it every day going to my Shanghai office. It says, Germany's here to do business. And surrounding that facility is lots of companies who have outgrown it um, and have created their own operations in China. So there's practical experiences and practical knowledge we, which we can pick up from our, our colleagues who I think historically saw manufacturing as a more important element to their economy than sadly we have done. Uh, but the opportunities going forward, I think, are certainly there. So I'm not downheartened by it at all. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's brilliant. And we actually have a question in from the audience that which of the trade deals that have already been done between the UK and non-EU countries offer better prospects for UK manufacturing? Uh, and to what extent? I mean, some of that, Robin, you've already answered a bit. I mean, Stephen, do you have any views on this? Um, yes, I do. I mean, the point about it is when you get into the detail, Robin's quite right there. We have we have manufacturers that produce finished goods or finished items or products. And for them, where they're not, where they don't um, have a direct competitor in the EU, or if they do have a direct competitor, very often it's quite, quite um, positive for them to go further abroad and to export into those new markets. And, and then it's all about the support mechanism. I think I completely agree with that point. And we can come back to that perhaps. But the other point about business with the EU is that we have a large amount, about 100,000 plus companies who don't consider themselves exporters, they are part of an integrated supply chain. So these, part, these are supplying components into gearboxes in Stuttgart, and then they're doing it backwards and forwards across the border 12 times before they reach the finished assembly. And we have a lot of those companies, and that's grown as a result of proximity to the EU. Now, one of the challenges when you talk to those companies, which are typically smaller businesses, is that they absolutely don't think of themselves as exporting, and they haven't done for the last few decades. That's, it's as easy to ship a crankshaft to Stuttgart as it is to Sheffield if you're based in Manchester. It makes no, makes no difference to them or hasn't made any difference to them so far. We're now, we're now putting them in the position that's an export and you have to do all the customs paperwork and everything else. And it's, and it's that group of companies that are the challenge. And, and because of the proximity issue, we've actually grown that quite substantially. So, so we have to think about manufacturing in certain sectors. There are great innovative companies like Robbins, which have finished goods and can be competitive on the world stage. And there are those which are part of an integrated supply chain. We've got lots of people making LED lenses for cars for Italy, for example, and they're competing with the local supplier there. They just happen to have better or more efficient technology, but they've never thought of that as an export. That's an internal market business. And they've got to try and reorientate their business into finding 
a component supply in another country outside of the EU. And that's quite a big challenge and something that does need a lot of assistance to do. Um, I would point out, of course, that DIT, which is uh, the department responsible for this, is probably one of the smallest funded departments in Whitehall. I think its budget's around 500 million pounds a year. Um, so you'd have thought, to use Robin's example about the Germans, that we might want to invest quite a bit more in that government support mechanism to, to help companies go and promote it overseas. I think the last point I'd make, Peggy, is that, you know, despite a lot of the bluster, um, a lot of the trade deals that have been struck are continuity agreements. They are simply standstill on where we are at the moment. They're not adding things. When we see in the press 900 billion of new trade deals signed, they are standstill arrangements. We already, already had those situations before. They are not adding. What we've yet to see is additive trade deals, things on top of that. And I think if we get somewhere with the US one, but again, we're doing 20% of our exports at the moment without a trade deal. I, like Robin, I've spent my career selling to hundreds of uh, countries around the world and UK manufacturers have been quite good at doing that. Um, what we do need is a step change in the ambition of some of those trade deals, if they're going to make any difference at all. And if they're gonna compensate, particularly for that risky group of that 100,000 plus companies that are just involved in the proximity business, the actual supply chain activity with the EU. It's those that worry me more than anything else, I would say, Peggy. Brilliant, thank you. I was actually just gonna say what percentage of our manufacturing population is part of that integrated supply chain. I mean, I know aerospace very well, and I know that's hugely important to aerospace as well, the kind of bits going back and forth across borders. And that's something, the simple way of thinking, if, if you think about the UK exports, 53% UK are manufactured goods of the total country's exports. Around half of that is EU trade. So it's, right. it's by far the biggest part of what we do in terms of now what we call exports because it's out because we're outside the EU. Brilliant. Thank you. Listen, I can see there are loads more questions coming. So I'm just going to say to the audience, apologies if I don't get to your question right away, because I'm going to try and keep that last few minutes to ask these questions. But we have to then move on to um, another topic. I, there's loads more questions I want to ask, um, but I might include some of the some of these in the final topic, which will be looking at industrial strategy. Um, obviously, the pandemic has we've heard already from Stephen and, and from Robin things that the government uh, needs to do things that politicians need to get behind. I'm going to throw a question to our two politicians on the panel and just say, um, why on earth can you not make an industrial policy stick? When Stephen said we need an industrial policy, forgive me, Stephen, my eyes rolled and I thought, you know, I've been doing this job since 2014. I think I've gone through three industrial strategies. I'm a little bit tired of having to constantly do a new one. Why can't we have one that sticks, that gives industry what it needs, a 10-year perspective? What's so hard about that? Everybody presumably wants manufacturing to succeed and to, to, to flourish. Lord Hammond, I'm going to ask you first. Well, um, uh, it's a very good question. Um, and the industrial strategy that uh, Theresa May's government launched was intended to be a long term strategy. But unfortunately, governments change and therefore um, uh, priorities can change. Look, I think um, if, if I can just summarize what we've talked about today in the short term, industry is understandably focused on the short term challenges of trying to overcome the new barriers that have been put in the way of its day-to-day -day business. And survival and prosperity absolutely means that they have to focus on that. But in the medium term, the truth is our terms of trade with the world have changed. Um, we are not going to be able to trade with the European Union through integrated supply chains in the same way that we have in the past. And there will be a period of structural change, which will be on top of a period of structural change dictated by COVID as well. And out of that, we have to make sure that we end up with a better, more competitive, and that means higher productivity, UK manufacturing economy going forward. And that I think that is within our grasp, but it will need a stable background uh, environment of policy. There are huge opportunities as we move into the fourth industrial um, revolution. Productivity has been Britain's Achilles heel for decades now. I talked about virtually nothing else uh, for three years as Chancellor. And um, it may be that the COVID pandemic and the shock of uh, breaching our traditional 
trade relationship with the European Union may actually be capable of being turned to advantage now to ensure that uh, we have a trade policy environment, uh, an industrial strategy environment, which allows business to seize those opportunities. Because we've got perhaps a unique circumstance where the instincts of business to, to innovate, uh, to invest, to go out and take new markets, is absolutely aligned with the political narrative of the government. Now, I would say this as my sort of closing message to business. You've got a new business secretary, very, very keen to make his mark. I spoke to him at the weekend. Um, I would advise business to treat this as a new opportunity to shape the government's recovery strategy for industry. Um, lobby that new, trade, uh, new um, business secretary, uh, lobby the government for what business needs, focus on the practicalities, um, and, you know, and I'm probably the key person to address this remark to myself, but don't let's keep harping on about what has happened. It has happened. I, I personally don't believe it's a positive, but it's happened. And what we now have to do is move on and focus on how we can exploit the opportunities that do exist um, in the future. And that will require a unique level of cooperation between government and industry. Thank you, Lord Hammond. And and Bridget, what's what is your view about you know what is the likelihood that you know the opposition could even come up if you were in government come up with a an industrial policy that would stick and last across regime change regime changes across government changes. Yeah, I mean, I think as Stephen quite rightly set out earlier on, you know, we we've seen quite a lot of short term uh, tinkering, and we need to look to that. That broader landscape around what will need to be put in place for the UK to prosper you know, for decades into the future. So, you know, the, the thinking that we as a party are doing is very much rooted in not simply what lay, what the UK will look like um, in 2024, but what the kind of country that we will need to build right through the 2030s as well. And I, I think some of that is about in terms of pushing the government on what we do in the next few years around matching up that rhetoric with the need to deliver on their promises and on the investment in infrastructure, particularly that our country will need to see. So just, I suppose just to take one example, um, you know, in the northeast of England, we've got a fantastic automotive sector, um, not just in terms of Nissan, but also all of those supply chain companies, many of them small, that are grappling with many of the challenges that we've been talking about today. And it's quite right that we do see a move towards electric vehicles, but at the same time, we need that to be accompanied with a longer term plan around the infrastructure that we'll need to accompany that in order to make it uh, as successful as possible. And, you know, I don't think any of us can properly appreciate at this point the longer term uh, issues thrown up by the pandemic. I mean, both those structural in terms of the UK economy, but also in terms of how we work uh, and those longer term changes uh, around the world of work. I think, of course, you know, it has brought home to us um, how important a stable internet connection is, of course, for, for children as well, who are doing more and more of their work right now uh, from home. But again, you know, we're facing the prospect of delayed uh, rollout where it comes to that super fast broadband across large parts of our country that we will need to see if we are to address that productivity challenge that I think Lord Hammond quite rightly addresses. But hand in hand with that, you know, we haven't seen the support for skills and retraining, I think, over the course of the last decade that would put us in a much stronger position uh, to compete as an economy. And too many of the jobs that have been created in large parts of our country where we need to see that growth and productivity most have sadly been low paid or insecure. We need to see a much greater push towards supporting business to create well paid, highly skilled jobs that will not just support families uh, through what has been a very difficult time, but will also have that knock on effect into our economy as well. You know, we hear a lot about levelling up from the government. I think we need to see that that isn't simply a slogan, but that involves real change, uh, real positive change uh, in every part of our country as well. Thank you. Absolutely. I think the training issue is particularly acute as we come out of COVID. And, and I know, Robin, you've done something quite innovative recently. I mean, one of my big complaints, and it's sort of a personal anecdote, but I can see that, you know, we keep talking about we need coding, we need coders, we need software folk, etc. I, I have a relative who's searching for a job, has done one of these boot camps, 
every single job advertisement says you need one to two years experience in industry. Now he's just gone and spent 10 grand on doing a course and everything, but he needs that experience first. So, you know, companies have to step up. It isn't just about the politicians in this industrial policy. It's not let the government set the roadmap. It is actually companies have to do something, don't they? Yeah. Well, I'm just taking your point there. And um, we, we found, we were looking for a, a mechanical engineer and we had 96 applicants for one of our, our one of those positions. Um, I then looked at what was happening around the, around us and decided we would actually create uh, 10 uh, postgraduate uh, courses for, for a year for people. These were the jobs we didn't actually uh, need, but we wanted to create some uh, employment for young people. Uh, we didn't see the government policy being the right one, so we're just going to fund it ourselves from, from the start. We had 340 applicants for those 10 positions. Now, we've got nine of them started today. In fact, I haven't met them at all yet, but I will be meeting them later. We then went out and said, created another six, which we're looking for to come and join us uh, on the manufacturing floor, get some hands-on experience for a year. Again, on the same sort of 10 pounds an hour, plus all the benefits that go with it, treat people as with respect and everything else in the hope that some of those people will stay with us. But if not, at least give them a chance to having had a year of hands-on experience. So I'm with you, Peggy. We need to do it both from a company point of view, if we're financially capable of doing it. Uh, but you know, that 340 people looking for those 10 positions we had just seems an awful lot of waste of money we had spent on university for three, four years. So uh, hopefully more people can step up to the mark on it. Brilliant. Thank you. I, I think that's really important for everyone listening to remember. And if you can set up one year jobs, um, you know, there, there's a benefit on, on both sides. Um, I'm going to move very quickly to, to Q&A and take some of these questions now. Um, I think here's an interesting one. Um, are there sufficient funding options available for UK manufacturers to invest in the sunrise industries? Uh, David Tilston uh, says his observation is that US investors are much more comfortable in making higher risk, higher potential reward investments in new technologies. How much is of an obstacle is that for us here in the UK? Cara, do you see that? I mean, do you, you have an international perspective on um, investment in things like AI and new technologies. Do you think that, do companies complain to you that there's not enough incentive to do this here in the UK? Um, I think, yeah, we've, we've definitely got kind of a very potentially different VC community than, than the US, which obviously does, you know, hold itself out particularly in that kind of um, sunrise industry so I think um, you know that is something I think companies coming up with ideas I think we see lots of innovation and I certainly do my job I think making sure that that has a market so I think looking at the market and kind of what is what can we solve the market issue rather than innovation for for that so I think you know really there's probably two sides to that it's making it a backable solution as well as also you know I will I will say we don't necessarily have the same VC community in the U.S. If I then go on to kind of what what do I see in technology, I think the UK is doing well on, you know, our distribution channels. So how we do kind of risk monitoring, face monitoring, real time uh, monitoring is all good. And actually we lead the way in a lot of that. So we are looking at our distribution channels and putting investment into that. Um, on our product development and innovation, we are also um, seeing a really good step change in our um, manufacturers looking at that. And, you know, if you look at somewhere like Japan, they are leading the way in smart factory robotics. So, you know, there's different places where I think we do lead. There's other places where um, we, we don't. Um, but we're not doing too badly, actually, um, compared, to, compared to some other countries. So I think it's really trying to build upon some of those technological advances looking at cloud platform um, and making sure we are being as thoughtful as possible. And to Robin's point, using some of those youngsters coming into the business to really be thoughtful about how they can improve other aspects and actually getting a very collaborative approach. Lots of employees want to help improve their business and, and contribute from what they see in their own personal lives and um, in our consumerism of how we use an iPhone compared to business to business and really taking businesses along the stages there. I mean, just to add that very quickly, if there were one thing you could put into an industrial policy to um, build on that, those those areas of expertise, what would it be? 
Um, I think from my point, it's come up a few times, but I think it needs to about the training of our people, retraining and how we do the skills, upskilling. We've talked about upskilling for a, for a long time now, but actually it's not just about skilling of our children as they come through. Um, it's also about the reskilling of people as they move industry and making the agility that we have available um, to people as they have different careers in their lifetimes, which is the way it is now. Thank you. Um, the second question from Keith Pringle. Is there a case to promote a weak sterling value, weaker than international currencies, as a means to promote major import substitution and make our exports more competitive, especially versus the euro? Stephen, what's your view on that? Uh, well, my view and uh, the view over, over some years now is that um, relying on sterling devaluation is not a great way of running a, a high technology manufacturing uh, sector. It needs to be a lot more stable than that. When, it, uh, when, when basically if you cheapen your exports, you, you make your imports more expensive and vice versa. The whole thing isn't really, a, it's good in the, sh you can see some benefits in the short term, but for long term policy, it needs to be about proper value added, proper investments and proper um, productivity and competitiveness and all of those things way above the change in the, in the, in the, chain, in the exchange rate. So, so I'd see that as a short term thing, but not as a long term sustainable position. Thank you. I think that's very clear. Um, uh, I think I will now turn to perhaps to uh, Lord Hammond and, and Bridget. If the government supports investment in new technologies, should they also protect the IP thus developed by restricting overseas takeovers of innovative businesses? I'd be interested in the political view on this. Um, will we start off with Bridget? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it presents um, a, a difficult challenge, and I mean, I suppose where it comes to you know we, we've seen a number of examples along these lines recently i mean the, the government i think at times finds it difficult um to intervene and to resolve some of this i mean given the position that we have as a country as stephen was just saying around um one that's based on on our kind of capacity to develop new products um particularly where it comes to kind of internet intellectual property and that kind of knowledge based economy i think we should be in a strong position to compete. Um, but sometimes I think we've seen a reluctance to grapple with whether that requires additional um, kind of active involvement from government on resolving that. I mean, I'd, if I'm honest, I don't think that there are easy answers on much of this. This is something that we're actively looking at, but I, I think any government, uh, regardless of Stripe, should you know, seek to do what we can to, to protect the capacity of our economy uh, and that kind of uh, product that's being created within the UK. Thank you, Bridget. Lord Hammond, you know, the takeover of ARM, first by SoftBank, then NVIDIA has been decried as, you know, the loss of a great British champion. Uh, there have been others. What is your view no. on whether we should seek ways to protect that IP and how should we do it? Well, I seem to remember when ARM was uh, taken over by um, SoftBank, uh, we heard exactly the same that this is the loss of a great british company and in fact it's a company that continued to thrive and prosper and create um, high paid high value added jobs in the uk but this is a classic long-term versus short-term challenge um, first of all i'm very clear that we have to have carefully defined areas where for national security purposes we need to restrict certain types of foreign ownership um, in critically sensitive businesses. That is a clear um, and defined category of businesses, hopefully quite small. What is a much bigger question is whether for purely economic purposes, we should seek to protect certain businesses from foreign ownership. And given that we are a country that depends very substantially on foreign investment, let's be blunt about this, we don't save very much as a nation. We have a very low savings ratio, which means we are um, exposed to the whims of international investors. Um, a nation that wants to encourage entrepreneurs to start businesses here in the hope of growing them and being able uh, to make large amounts of money from them. Given all those things, I think it would be an extraordinarily dangerous step to start suggesting that we are somehow going to restrict the marketplace for businesses that have been grown in Britain. That will make foreign investors extremely wary. 
it will make entrepreneurs think twice about whether they want to come to the UK uh, or stay in the UK and build their businesses here if they may not then be able to sell them um, in the international um, marketplace. So we need to be disciplined about this. We had this debate during the Theresa May government. Let's keep it narrowly focused on what is genuinely about national security. Let's, you know, we've, we've got this mantra, and I've heard the Prime Minister say it, that Britain is going to be the cheerleader for free trade. Well, let's take that principle forward and let's, let's not slip into a protectionist stance in terms of who can own our businesses. Thank you. And we're running out of time, but I'd be very interested to hear from Robin as the entrepreneur. Do you agree with that view or do you think there should be more protection when you're going into China to enable you to safeguard your, your IP? Um, <clears throat> it's important to protect it if you're exporting. I'm just, I want to go back to the one about the sort of protecting the UK. I think the challenge I think for us in the UK is we're, we are a small island country and therefore we have to live by exporting. The domestic market is not big enough. The challenge is you grow a business to a certain size, and I get contacted every month by a number of companies saying, I want to buy you. Uh, the challenge is that the, most of those companies would shut, might shut me down, and I'd lose all the people who are here, and they'd move their manufacturing to Singapore, China, America, Germany, or elsewhere. And that, is, that would be a really sad indictment of all the work that we got to this stage. Um, I'm with you, Lord Hammond. Uh, we want to have free trade backwards and forwards, but there, there has to be, I think, one greater aspirations that people will keep growing a business and it has to be there politically to motivate them. So people like JCB, who could have sold out many, many years ago, kept on going and kept on building their business, um, as opposed to you know, short-termism short of grow a business, make enough money, sell up, move to Spain and, and, and sit there on the beach. Um, but it does need to be tied into that sort of, you know, economic policy or, or business strategy policy. Um, so it is a challenge um, and not all business people will want to carry on running their business. At some point they may well want to sell. So I would want to keep it in the UK or the knowledge in the UK if at all possible. Thank you very much, Robin. So we have uh, just one minute left. I think if each panelist could just give 20 seconds of what's the message you want to get across, and then we'll have to go. Um, I'll start, Stephen, what is in, in 20 seconds, can you say your main message from this and what you want people to take away? I suppose one way of summing this conversation up might be, what do we want to do with our new freedom, Peggy, actually? That's probably one of the questions that comes out of this sort of discussion, isn't it? I mean, from my perspective, having this clear long-term industrial plan, an industrial strategy that's fit for the future, which covers many of the aspects we've spoken about today, has got to be number one priority, I think. Thank you. Cara? Um, I think mine's slightly similar, Peggy. I think we've now um, hitting 2021 with lots of um, things against us, but I think what I take from the findings of the report is there's also positivity, there's a bit more clarity about what this year will look like and therefore hopefully we can build confidence to make some long-term decisions. Oh, Bridget, sorry. Uh, thanks very much. I think just finally uh, from me, I'd just say, you know, from, from the opposition's perspective, um, as a party under new leadership, we're keen to work with business, to listen to business concerns, to seek to work collaboratively in addressing them. I think we've seen during this pandemic what can be achieved when government, government and business work together uh, in that collaborative manner. And we're keen to do that, uh, to work with you, to listen to your concerns. And I think we've had some really important themes picked up today. So thanks very much. Thank you, Bridget. And Lord Hammond, how are you well, gonna? I think, I, I think we need to um, work our way through the short-term challenges, both of uh, COVID um, delivered and Brexit delivered challenges. But then we need to focus relentlessly on the future and the message for the future is productivity. If we increase our productivity year on year, we increase our trend rate of growth year on year and the living standards of our people year on year. And if we get the productivity riddle unpicked in this country, we will have a prosperous and bright future. If we fail to address the productivity challenge, I'm afraid the future looks a lot less encouraging for us. And it is about skills, it is about infrastructure investment, 
It is about improving the flow of capital um, to businesses. If I had to choose, I would say it's probably skills first and foremost. And actually, most businesses recognize that skills are, their, are the most value generating asset they have. When they buy a business like Robbins um, with uh, high skills in it, they do not move to shut it down and relocate it. They will regard all of those skills as precious assets that they want to protect for the future. Thank you, Lord Hammond. Um, James, can I ask what message you want to leave? Sure, on the back of what Lord Hammond just said, in terms of productivity, there's there's definitely for 2021, despite all, all the doom and gloom and the issues that the pandemic has caused, there are green shoots that have best practice and best practice and lessons learned in terms of right down to the metal, in terms of operational day-to-day -day things in manufacturing businesses, but in terms of how capital is managed and a sort of general lesson in constrained op, um, optimization manufacturers in the UK that lessons that could be taken forwards, both in terms of staffing investment strategy and how um, the choice of product lineup um, to, to maximize efficiency and a step towards solving that that productivity puzzle. Brilliant, thank you. And finally, Robin, you've got the last word. What, what message do you want to leave both to the audience and the panelists? Uh, I would say don't listen to the naysayers, uh, whether you are for the Brexit or against it, it's happened. I think we've got some fantastic opportunities as a country. Um, let's go out there and, uh, you know, sell, sell all our, sell the products we manufacture. We've got some fantastic things going on. So I think we could be a lot more positive than we can be and sort of maybe sometimes just switch off the news because it's all rather depressing. Brilliant, thank you. And uh, I want to thank our panelists for what I think was a really stimulating conversation. I'm terribly sorry, my apologies to the audience who sent some really other good questions. I was planning to hold some of them when we got onto subjects about servicing and innovation and we didn't quite manage it. So my sincere apologies to all of you, but thank you panelists for a great session. And thank you in particular for a fantastically detailed and interesting report on the outlook for 2021. Thank you everybody and see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.